fear and caution. Ethiopians are expressing their views about their country's newly forged peace deal in a VOA town hall discussion. We will bring you the highlights. We have an interview with Pamela Coke Hamilton from the International Trade Center. She will tell us how women entrepreneurs can overcome discrimination and roadblocks to access financing. Also, how they can unlock opportunities in Africa's new free trade pact. Straight Talk Africa starts right now. Hello and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory in for Haiti Adams. Thanks for joining me. Ethiopians worldwide are anxiously waiting and watching to see if a fragile peace deal meant to end the conflict in the Ethiopia's Tigra region will hold. On November 2nd, 2022, and just days before the two-year anniversary of the war in Tigray, the Ethiopian government signed a peace agreement in Pretoria, South Africa, with the leadership in Ethiopia's Tigray region. Voice of America recently held a town hall discussion on the conflict here in Washington with a group of people from the Ethiopian diaspora. The event called Ethiopia Paths to Peace brought together activists, scholars and representatives from multiple ethnic groups. Here's what some of them had to say. Negative. The peace agreement is a negative peace because violence has stopped. But to go further, the opportunity of a ceasefire is important and gleaning from conflicts in other parts of Africa to understand the logical pattern of war and address the core issues of how the war started. What surprises me is that as much as some people are dedicated to their own side and ethnicity, why is it difficult to empathize with those who live side by side when they are suffering? When are we going to cut the cycle of never-ending crimes and continuous feelings of being attacked and build a country that is enough for all of us and stands for justice, equality and democracy? When are we going to be human? Well, this town hall was a rare opportunity for Ethiopians to discuss the nearly two years of conflict that has torn the country apart. Joining me here in studio is Alula Kebede, an international broadcaster from VOA's Amharic News Service. He moderated the town hall discussion. Also joining me is VOA's Salam Solomon. She has covered the region for years and reported on that event. Alula and Salam, welcome uh, to uh, uh, Soy Talk Africa now. Let me start with you, Alula, listening to the town hall. You were there, you moderated it. Uh, one of the themes that ran through uh, looks like it's a question of coexistence of uh, the communities in Ethiopia. Uh, what do you get uh, in terms of the sense of how the people in the diaspora see things as compared to those who are in the country, in Ethiopia, in the Tigray region? Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for having me, uh, Vincent. Um, as you um, mentioned in your intro introduction, um, the, the participants came from, I mean, this event brought um, activists and scholars uh, from uh, diverse uh, communities and segments of society. And their opinions are very diverse, clearly. That's why we invited this group. Um, and the, the discussion was just to allow them to express uh, what they feel. The, the war is still fresh. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people died uh, during a fairly short period of time, within uh, less than two years. I mean, two years. Uh, so the, the sense I have got from that event is, including from the audience, uh, the live audience, and also um, videos, packages from around the area, from the various cities in the US, uh, they are hopeful, they are happy that the uh, peace agreement is signed, but they have, you know, they have concerns, uh, lingering problems to be resolved, and they don't think this agreement will solve everything. Clearly, it, it's going to take time. Mm -hmm. There are uh, lots of work remaining, um, but mostly they are hopeful. Some uh, chose uh, a more conciliatory tone. Um, but they expressed hope for the most part. Yes. Now, Salim, uh, the fact that uh, many of this are talking about, well, they're excited about the peace prospect, everybody wants a peace deal, uh, but they still have uh, certain concerns. Did that um, become part of the discussion of the peace process itself, the historical issues that needed to be addressed? 
Right. Uh, I mean, that's what was very exceptional about this town hall. Uh, you know, the Ethiopians, uh, specifically here in the Washington DC area or even the US, uh, they can sometimes be insular, meaning politically insular. And so uh, they would be around their own community that might reinforce or confirm their political views. So one ethnic group would have a certain uh, political view, another might have the, a certain political view. So what this town hall did is expose most of them that might be not be able to listen to each other. And so, you know, some accounts of victims were shared during the discussion. Uh, and so they were confronted with issues that they haven't been maybe uh, willing to listen to each other. And it was very civil to listen to. As you said, lingering issues, the core issues uh, in Ethiopia right now is ethnic division. Ethnic violence is very rife in, in the country. Uh, and so the communities that represent, that came to the town hall were from different ethnic groups. Um, of course, the focus of the discussion was the war in Tigray. Um, and a lot of people who, uh, you know, shared uh, victim voices. And so that made it rare and unique in, in a sense that people who had completely extreme different uh, political views were having a civil discussion uh, in this town hall. And, and Alula, looking at how the conversation was uh, developing from when they started, did you see like there was a kind of a development in uh, this uh, kind of a the, the, the willingness to listen to each other, to understand each other's perspective as they continued this conversation during the town hall? I would say the best that this town hall accomplished is to bring these people uh, together and listen to each other. Um, most never had a chance to sit down together to discuss. Everybody you know, speaks from the point of view. They, they feel like uh, their communities are uh, hurt. But for the first time, I would say, especially over the course of this uh, two years, and to come together in, um, you know, in one table and to be able to listen to each other is the, the best part of this uh, town hall, I would say. So Salah, would you say that the town hall was also kind of representative of the views of the people on the ground in Ethiopia in terms of the ethnic um, concerns and of course the whole question of uh, national peace and, uh, and, and harmony? Absolutely. I mean, when I said, you know, some, some of the communities outside the country might be insular, it's reflective of what's happening in the country. Uh, the ethnic divisions uh, are, uh, you know, the, the root causes of, 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 of this. And the other main issue is also uh, disputed land uh, is a huge problem in the country. And so that obviously is aligned with ethnic. Uh, it's all interlinked, unfortunately. And what was uh, reflecting back on uh, the town hall and also the peace process in the country in general, uh, when you look back and think about how fast in the past two years, how many people have been, thousands have been displaced, millions have been impacted by this war, this complete carnage, basically. Um, and uh, in the past couple of uh, weeks since November, uh, last year now, uh, the speed in which the peace process has taken root is very promising. Uh, just yesterday, they announced that the, the Tigrayan forces are giving away arms, which is part of the agreement, the peace process agreement. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's positive changes that are happening right now. And so people were ready to have a dialogue yeah. within each other, within the communities. Yeah, but I don't know, do you, it, does it seem to you that uh, those in the community, in their diaspora, and those that were in the town hall, uh, have gone through the peace agreement and kind of uh, do, uh, kind of understand what is in it? And, and so, if so, do they have issues with that deal itself? Not necessarily with this uh, uh, the agreement itself, but as we discussed earlier, they believe there are lingering issues that needs to be addressed, and they're not uh, they're not sure this agreement will uh, you know will address those issues. But the, the, on the other hand, this is just the beginning. You know, uh, for these people to come again, like I said, to uh, sit down together, uh, see eye to eye, and listen to what other uh, might feel, because. Um, in the past, at least um, again in the past uh, two years, they choose the media. They feel like they're comfortable. They, you know, speak whatever they feel, but they never try to address, uh, you know, across 
uh, other communities. And uh, I can I understand this is very painful for uh, many members of the communities. People are affected directly, their family members, um, and also many more are still displaced. And there are killings going on as we speak right now in parts of the country. So it's just the beginning. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, Salem, uh, this was a wonderful opportunity for people from different sides to kind of sit together and have a civil discussion. They may disagree, um, but you think this is a microcosm of what can happen in the country, inside Ethiopia, where people can actually get together in rooms and talk about the issues? Freely at least open. Yeah, I mean, it's at least a, a sign of uh, there's a start of something. Yeah. Um, part of the, when the peace deal was signed, uh, part of what was very promising to see is the federal government delegation that went to the uh, capital city of the Tigray region, for instance, didn't have any bodyguards or uh, security with them. Trust is a main, um, you know, issue that these communities have, have had for quite some time. And so to see that uh, the delegation didn't have any uh, you know, security around them showed some sort of trust between the leadership, at least yeah. the elite. Uh, but within the communities, still there is, uh, you know, lingering issues like l land. Land is a huge uh, disputed land, to be specific, is a is a, is a, is a big problem. Uh, but we've seen also a high level, you know, when um, the blockade that was. Uh, that was on uh, uh, the Tigray region, like, you know, uh, blocking of humanitarian aid, uh, access to internet and uh, communications, banking, a flight resumed just at the end of uh, December to fly from the capital city to the re yeah. uh, Tigray region. Yeah. Athletes were, athletes, or more specifically, long distance runners were coming in to, sure. to reconnect with their families that they haven't spoken oh, to for two sure. years. And Thank so, you. yeah. Yeah, I mean, we all want to see peace and hope that this uh, town hall would actually trigger something even uh, long-lasting in terms of conversation. Salim and uh, Lula, I want to thank you very much for joining us here on Straight Talk, uh, Talk Africa and for your excellent reporting. Now, after the break, Katie Adams interviews the head of the International Trade Center, Pamela Coke Hamilton. How can you better access financing for your business and what opportunities are available for budding women ent entrepreneurs under the African Continental Free Trade Pact? Uh, that is coming up when Straight Talk uh, returns. Welcome back. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has the world's highest rate of women entrepreneurship. That's according to the 2021 MasterCard Index of Women Entrepreneurs. Studies also show that women face widespread discrimination in business and battle to access the financing needed to grow their enterprises. Uh, Pamela Koch Hamilton is the executive director of the International Trade Center. She says while these barriers need to be eliminated, there are ways women can succeed and benefit from new businesses and trade opportunities in the, on the continent. Heidi Adams spoke with Koch Hamilton recently here in Washington. Pamela, what are the greatest advantages that women business owners or entrepreneurs in emerging markets have mm -hmm. at the moment? And similarly, what disadvantages or barriers mm -hmm. do they face that you believe need to be addressed and eliminated urgently? Thanks so much, Heidi. The first advantage I would say, and this has occurred actually on turbocharge in the digital world, COVID has literally transformed how trade happens. It's almost tripled the amount of digital trade. So digitalization actually is now the greatest advantage that women traders have. One, because it's online and therefore it lowers their costs. Their overhead costs, costs for physical space, for storage, they can literally operate from anywhere. The second reason is that it also has an anonymity. And because of that, any kind of discrimination vis-a-vis -vis gender is lessened. They can be anything behind the wall of a screen. And so that 
is the biggest, I find, um, benefit right now, advantage. On the disadvantage side, globally, what we found is one, the access to finance. That continues to be the biggest challenge. This is a recurring theme. Recurring decimal. Mm -hmm. It is a recurring theme and it's something that we have to address. So what we do is we try to work with women to help them access finance, to put in place the kinds of mechanisms. One thing we found is co most collateral that's requested is 125% of their business. 125%. Nobody can afford that. The second thing is that they also are unable to meet some of the requirements for paperwork because so many of them are informal and they're small and they're not in the industries that require that kind of paperwork. So we want to try to also see how we can work with them to build up their capacity to get financing. Um, the informality of the sector is another issue. Many women are informal, at least 50%. How do we get them to move into a more formal space so that they can qualify for access for financing? Um, and these are the general disadvantages that we found for women. The issue of discrimination is also a huge thing, especially on the cross-border trade in Africa. Um, but we have decided, okay, how do we help them through trade facilitation address those challenges? And you work, of course, on the international scale, yes. in international trade. Uh, can you tell us what are the opportunities mm -hmm. for women um, that bridge international trade mm -hmm. between African countries and international markets? And here I'm talking both for African-owned women businesses mm -hmm. to make it into global markets, but also opportunities from trade right. um, going the other way, from right. other parts of the world into Africa. Sure. Um, I would say there, there are a few. The opportunities, for example, under the African continental free trade area, which we were talking about earlier. I think one of the first things that needs to happen is women need to begin to understand what is the AFCFTA about and what are the potential areas that they can engage. Because it is a game changer. It is going to completely transform not only intra-African trade, but trade between Africa and other countries. It is going to reposition, both geopolitically and trade-wise, how Africa is seen and how Africa engages with the world. And so the opportunities under the AFCFTA are myriad. We have done studies um, made by Africa study that looked at the 94 most um, powerful value chains that could work across Africa. And we narrowed it down to four main ones. That's uh, pharmaceutical, automotives, textiles and apparel, and baby food. And what we found is that those are the ones that actually can move quickly. So you start with the front runners and then you move forward. The other area that's very important is utilizing the digital space in a more um, concerted and definitive way. We, for example, have worked with a company in Ghana called Adi and Bolga. And what they have done is turned AI as a useful tool for makeup for black women. Because what it is able to do is to utilize artificial intelligence technology to look at our skin in a different way and actually target the dermatological impact of, you know, how our skin is different. And therefore, how makeup needs to be adjusted to address our skin, which is a blind spot, as we know, in the beauty industry. Um, we've also worked with women on, in Rwanda on digital engagement blockchain for coffee production that helps with the digital traceability of the coffee value chain, which increases their sales value and also increases their potential for markets, especially in the organic market field. And then the final thing is, is what I call the strategic multi-stakeholder partnerships. This opportunity is important because we work with companies, for example, like uh, DHL, that we managed to say to them, help these small businesses, women-owned businesses especially, get preferential packages to send their products abroad. And so they get lower rates. They're able to send to the US, to Europe, everywhere at lower rates. We also work with eBay in Kenya to put um, products online. Right, so that they can sell and be part of the whole e-commerce industry. So these are the opportunities that we've seen that have been emerging and that more and more women are taking advantage of. And uh, staying on this um, mm -hmm. theme, theme, these themes around the Africa continent, mm -hmm. African continental free trade um, area, mm -hmm. 
Pamela, have you found in your work mm -hmm. at the International um, Trade Center that women have access, not mm -hmm. just to finance, but access to the information mm -hmm. they need about how this mm -hmm. free trade area really mm -hmm. impacts them. Mm -hmm. Because as you and I were talking yeah. about, y you may watch this on television mm -hmm. and see we, we do all these agreements are oh, being yeah. signed. <laughs> and it looks wonderful on the international yes. stage, but for women who have to go out there and really face the on the ground yes. realities, yes. Uh, what needs to be done in that area yeah. still? And what have you found? What are women telling you? Okay, so we did actually um, ITC, uh, did a study, a uh, survey of thousands of women across Africa about their knowledge of the AFCFTA agreement, what it means. 75% of them did not know, did not know about it, did not know what it was. And so we re realized that this is going to be a significant problem because if we're moving into an agreement that is supposed to transform intra-African and Absolutely. African external trade, then the people who are involved need to know. So what we did is we partnered with the 50 women's business associations across Africa. We also are able to cover over a million women who are engaged with those business associations through our She Trades initiative. What we have also done is we've launched how to export under the AFCFTA. We've done training programs to engage women to explain to them what is going to be required, the issues to do with rules of origin, standards, market intelligence, etc. We've also tried to work with them on how to impact um, the new market spaces that will be open, especially in cross-border trade. Um, we've also looked at them, helped to work with packaging, labeling, all of these new things that are going to emerge and are going to become even more important. The knowledge factor is critical because, as I said, I've negotiated agreements my entire life and I've seen too many of them sit on shelves and never translate to real trade. And so for me, the AFCFTA needs to be one of those that goes beyond that. And I think the protocol on women and youth is also specifically designed to try to address that issue as well. And so we're working with the AFCFTA Secretariat. We've signed an MOU with them. We're also working with the African Union, as well as the Economic Commission on Africa and, and various other African entities. The other thing we do is we also work with the business support organizations in each country. So we work as uh, almost like a interlocutor with the Nigerian Export Promotion Corporation. We work with uh, GEPA, which is the Ghana Export Promotion Agency. Uh, we work with the South Africans. We work with Zim Trade. Um, we work with Ken, Ken Trade. So we work across the continent also on ensuring that they, as the BSOs, are able to support their constituents as well. So it's a kind of train the trainers, you know, giving them the capacity and, and benchmarking them to be able to help their own businesses in the field. What is your advice to women about what they can do in their mm -hmm. businesses to increase their chances of yeah. gaining access, access to finance and investment? And here I mean advice that women can immediately yes. apply to like their right work. now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so let me just give you a, a kind of outline of what we've done in the area of access to finance. Just uh, in 2019, we launched a She Trades Invest Care Fund with Bamboo Capital. And the idea was how do we link um, the, the, the lack of access to finance to capital um, providers and, and kind of create a space where women can get access to whether it's venture capital or other forms of capital. We also work with women to prepare them to make the pitch because most don't have that, right. you know what I mean? So we, we work with them through this to help them make it. And then we also work with financial institutions on the other side to also help them to become more gender you know, balanced. Yes, right. because there are things that you know, most financial institutions have a traditional approach. Mm. Bring the collateral, bring the piece of paper with the land. Most women are not on that piece of paper, you know? And this is a reality. So what we try to do is also work with the banking institutions to say, look, how do you facilitate a gender lens approach to what you do? So for women, the advice I'd give is the first thing, focus on the basics. Get your paperwork together. If you're going to go to people to ask them to invest, you kind of have to have a good argument. So get somebody to help you with the paperwork. We can do that. Help you with the paperwork. 
make sure also that you're online. I'll never forget a, a gentleman came to work with uh, some uh, fashion industry people I was working with in the Caribbean. And he said, the first thing he said was, look, I Googled all the fashion and all the people in this program. None of you are online. You don't exist. That's what he said. You don't exist. If you need an online presence, even a name and a picture, right? But you need something that people can find you, right? And so that's also important. It's important to go digital. The other thing is to ensure that you are able to engage with partners and with organizations that can help you. So reach out. You know, whether it's to your own business support organization, whether it's to us um, through the She Trade Invest program, it's online. You can go on shetrades.com. You will find all of that. Um, and, and just ensure that you understand that there's opening there, there are people looking out for you, and that there's opportunity. Um, uh, Pamela, we, we are, of course, globally, um, women are probably hardest hit and most impacted by the economic downturn we mm -hmm. are seeing around mm -hmm. the world and, of course, still recovering from the impacts of the COVID-19 yeah. pandemic. Now, of course, we understand business is cyclical, yeah. um, <laughs> but during these down cycles, yeah. what can be done to ensure that women don't lose the gains that yeah. they have already made? Yeah. Well, first of all, <laughs> The last two years have seen a significant, you know, setback for women. Significant. Over two million women left the work world because of COVID because they had to look after kids. That's the reality. So taking that into account, how can we create an ecosystem that better supports women? And I think that that is the fundamental issue here. We can add all kinds of other what would I call it, you know, programs and mechanisms. But if the ecosystem itself does not lend itself to the realities that women face, then all the other programs are simply dressing icing on a cake that doesn't exist. And so one of the first things I think in terms of addressing, you know, what women face is, I was at a World Economic Forum uh, program two weeks ago talking to, to business leaders. And they were talking about women and the seat at the table, you know, which is the, the general statement. And I said to them, you know, I was thinking about it. I think a lot at three in the morning. <laughs> so I was thinking about it and I said, this is the problem. Women, I don't want women to have a seat at the table. I want women to also design the menu. Wow. I want women to look at the plate settings. In other words, we need to have a construct where women aren't just invited to the table after it's already set and designed. We need to be understanding how this meal got here, what constituted this meal, how do we fit into making this meal what it is, and what are the plate settings so that I'm not put at the end of the table at the very end, back. And then we still talk about the portion we get Ex from what it's so. Exactly. Pamela Coke, Hamilton, thank you thank so you. very much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. That was Pamela Coke, Hamilton, Executive Director of the International Trade Center. And that's it for this edition of Straight Talk Africa. Thanks for our guests, to our guests and thanks to you, our audience, for being with us. Take care and goodbye.